Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to joining us. Uh, well, uh, thank you for joining us for our Prepare for Professional Indemnity Insurance Renewal event with GAC Beechcroft and Howdens. I'm delighted to offer this event. Uh, the more I've been speaking to uh, Claire Hughes Williams and her team at DAC Beechcroft, uh, the more uh, these events are just making sense where we're talking to other people as well about what they're planning for, you know, taking some real time to consider the impact, not just on, on COVID, but other market pressures as well. So um, I wasn't aware of some of these things, but they've been coming up in our other events time and time again. So I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here to, uh, with me to hear what they have to say. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping first, as usual, I'm recording the event, so feel free to turn your screen off, although I will only be recording the speakers for their presentations. There will be a Q&A session at the end. So I'm going to keep you all on mute for now, just so I can focus the video on the speakers. Um, and then feel free to unmute yourself or let me know if you want to converse in the Q&A session. That's not a problem. There is a chat function as well. So if you have a little look um, at your dials, you'll see a speech bubble. Click on there and you can choose to email just myself. So similar to a text or everyone in meeting. Um, so just be aware of who, who you're communicating with. Uh, I'll leave that open so you can converse with each other as well. Um, and I think, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. I can't think that there is. Um, if I do, I'll let you know. I will be sharing my screen at, at one point to go through some slides, uh, but I'm gonna hand over to Claire Hughes-Williams from DSC Beechcroft. She's going to introduce our fantastic speakers for the day and chair the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And thank you um, to you for asking us. And also thank you, Jenny, for joining us in this session. So. The aim of today's session is to try to, as Jenny um, has advertised, try to help you prepare uh, for renewal over the next um, few months. Over 60% of the profession still renew their fresh indemnity insurance in September. And so it's a crucial time for many firms. And uh, Jenny Screech of Howden um, has huge experience in this area. So uh, she's a qualified solicitor herself and uh, I've known Jenny for more years than we would want to admit to. <laughs> think. Um, so I first knew Jenny when she was working at SIF, which was the Solicitors Mutual, and which went into runoff in 2000. And then Jenny was at Zurich in their Solicitors Claims team. And now she's a legal professionals consultant with Howden. So this is her uh, bread and butter. Um, she regularly publishes articles, which uh, she'll share with all of the invitees after this session. Um, Catherine Davis is uh, my team partner and my colleague. Uh, we work very closely together and um, she's um, got a number of years, maybe she doesn't want to admit to how many either, um, as a solicitor in this area, acting for solicitors in relation to the defense of civil claims, advising solicitors on coverage, uh, policy coverage issues, and also um, representing solicitors in the defense of professional disciplinary proceedings. Um, Catherine's <clears throat> going to look at um, the prevalence of uh, claims against litigation lawyers. And um, I'm going to, uh, after Jenny speaks, I'm going to talk about the sorts of claims that real estate and property lawyers are facing at the moment. So uh, we can have a look at some trends and hopefully um, give some advice at least on how to avoid the most uh, prevalent and worrying uh, claims that we're seeing at the moment. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Jenny. And um, Emma, if you share your screen, please. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And I'll just wait for the slides to come along. Excellent. And if we could move to the first slide, Emma, thanks. As, as Claire has, has said, uh, 1st of October does remain the most significant renewal date for solicitors professional indemnity. Uh, so time is ticking and we're going to get there very quickly. Uh, and what we do need to tell you is that, regrettably, um, this is the hardest market for solicitors professional indemnity that we've seen um, since the move from SIF to the open market. Now, the catalyst for this was the Lloyd's Review um, back in 2018, and I'm sure you've all read um, about that. It identified professional indemnity generally as being a um, very poor performing um, class of business and Lloyd's um, required its syndicates to take urgent action to return uh, professional indemnity to profitable business company markets have followed that lead. Uh, it was really only at April 2019 that the solicitors PI market started to harden 
um, we all missed it by a hair's breadth at um, October 2018. Both the primary and top-up markets are affected, and I'll talk in more detail about that uh, in a moment. Uh, capacity um, and appetite um, amongst insurers has reduced. In terms of capacity, the most notable departures from the market have been um, large firm specialist Libra back in 2018, and in 2019, we had managing general agents um, Omni and uh, Maven uh, leave the solicitor's PI market. Claims activity is a real issue. It's always been a problem in relation to solicitor's um, PI but it's particularly the failed investment schemes and biofunder developments that are causing a, a great deal of pain for insurers. And I know that my uh, colleagues from DAC Beechcroft are going to talk more about that today. In addition to that, um, we have uh, potential claims activity and financial fallout from uh, COVID-19 that is a concern for insurers. So with that backdrop, let's look at what happened in April. If we can have the next slide, great. Well, we all went into lockdown on the 23rd of March, which wasn't ideal for a one April uh, renewal, but I can assure you that it was not a barrier to business and it's not going to be a barrier to getting the business done for one October either. Um, certainly our IT systems were um, up and running um, immediately and we were able to communicate well with our clients and insurers. As far as the primary um, two and three million of cover um, is concerned, um, there has been um, further rate increase. Now, just to give you an indication um, on our book, and this is all published in a market report that we've just put out about 10 days ago and um, will be available to you via legal news. Um, but across the book, the average rate increase was um, 18%. Now, it's interesting to look at how that breaks down because the book was combined of 12 month renewals and 18 month renewals. For 12 month renewals, the average increase was 14% for 18 months renewals, which you'd expect it to be higher. Um, and indeed it was at 19%. Um, percent. Still plenty of A-rated capacity um, in the market. Um, insurers were still there. Very limited appetite uh, for new business. Looking after their renew renewals, um, but when it comes to new business, particularly if a firm has got a significant conveyancing um, practice, um, insurers are very wary. Uh, so um, excess layers, um, same story there, increase in rates. And since the Lloyd's review, the excess layer market has gone up 50 to 100 percent, um, depending on um, the profile of your work and uh, your claims uh, activity. Um, also, capacity has reduced quite significantly um, in the market. And what we saw 1st of April for the first time ever um, was um, excess layers also wanting to have their own questionnaire completed. And it's the first time we've seen that, which again underlines the nervousness um, that there is uh, in um, this part of the market. Um, and certainly we're aware that um, in recent years, there are considerably more claims um, that have been hitting this layer. Historically, it's been very, very reasonably priced. And even though I say increases of 50 to 100%, you know, it, um, we're, we're starting from, in, in pound terms, um, you know, quite modest starting point. So it still definitely is an important purchase and represents value for money. Also in April, limited 18 month deals. Now, just to give you an indication of the change there, going into one April, 69% of our renewal book were on an 18 month deal. Post one April, that figure reduced to 12%. So that will just give you an indica indication. Firstly, limited appetite um, from insurers um, to offer 18 month deals and where they do generally with an uplift for the final six month period. And also firms, you know, seven days into lockdown um, were, you know, looking to protect their cash position. So there was you know, limited appetite from firms as well. So if we can have a look at the next slide. With that backdrop, uh, just giving you an indication of what we expect to see for the 1st of October. And again, for the primary um, two and three million, we're expecting to see further uh, rate um, increases. 
In terms of capacity, we're not on notice at the moment that there are any insurers leaving the market, but we are aware that a number of insurers have recently corresponded with the SRA calling for some rule changes for the 1st of October. What they're particularly concerned about is the potential for um, firms to fail as a result of the um, present situation. And of course, when a firm closes, um, there's a requirement for runoff cover um, for six years. Um, and the insurer has to provide that cover whether they're paid for it or not. So they're looking for a rule change that will mean that um, they would only have to provide the cover if the premium were paid. So we're watching very carefully. Our own view is that um, it's, it's a very short time frame now to get a, a rule change for um, 1 October. We would expect that such an important issue would have to go to consultation and certainly that the approval of the Legal Services Board would be needed. So it's really questionable as to whether there would be simply enough time to do that. Um, but it is an indication of the concern that um, underwriters have and tells us that we need to keep watching that situation very closely. 18 month deals, oh, firstly, appetite for new business, again, it'll be the same. Um, insurers have already indicated that uh, when it comes to, to new business, they are you know, um, settling um, limited thresholds, particularly with reference to conveyancing work. Um, 18 month deals, we expect those to be limited and affordability uh, again is likely to be an issue. As for the COVID-19 impact, um, first of all, um, I'm really sorry because I know the proposal forms are already very, very long, um, but you can expect some more questions. Um, just this week with our team at Howden, we were reviewing, it some, reviewing some question sets that we've received from um, insurers and trying to merge those together into to one questionnaire. And I can tell you that we're up to 32 questions and they're not yes, no questions either. You know, they will take some time um, to complete and there's quite a lot of information being requested. Another thing firms are asking us is whether they'll get any premium relief if they're forecasting um, reduced um, gross fees. Firstly, in response to this, generally insurers rate off your last completed financial year. Um, so, you know, obviously that um, is going to be an issue. And, you know, in um, a hard market such as we have, um, our view is not to um, expect premium relief, even if you are forecasting a reduction at this point. And as, as we said, solvency and potential for unpaid um, runoff uh, cover, a real concern um, for insurers. So expect lots of scrutiny and questions around that. Next slide. Okay, that, that's just a, a, a list there of sort of the areas where insurers are um, asking you know, questions. They want to know what your remote working arrangements were, that we want to see your business continuity plan. Um, wanting to know how many staff were furloughed, um, what the arrangements were to cover um, open files for um, staff that um, have been furloughed, um, wanting to know um, what arrangements you put in place for executing original documents um, during lockdown, whether everybody was able to access document management systems, uh, what um, additional cyber um, protections you put in place, what loans you've taken out, what your cash position is, uh, what um, your forecast is going forward in terms of fees, whether you're going to be able to meet your lease um, obligations and uh, other um, loan obligations. So as I said, quite a lot of detailed uh, information that we're looking for, so be prepared for that. Next slide. What are we going to do about it? And we've put out in our market report a five point um, action plan. And the first thing is talk to your broker early. If you are a 1 October um, renewal and you haven't spoken with your broker um, for the last two or three months, pick up the phone this afternoon and have a chat. Because it's all very well to look at you know, average rate increases, but it's really important to understand what's happening for your insurer, what their sensitivities are, and what that's going to mean for your firm, given your areas of practice and um, your claims history. 
agree a timeline with your broker for submission of your proposal form and then go back and set the deadlines within your firm for the people who need to provide you with information because it always takes longer than expect and there are going to be some more complications this year because people are remote working take time and care with the proposal form um, we say that every year uh, this is a huge spend uh, for firms and it justifies the time in making sure that it is completed as well and as comprehensively as possible. We've slipped back a slide, thank you. Um, so the other thing is to uh, review your budget, um, review your PI budget uh, and finally, um, once you've done that, start looking at um, the finance arrangements now. Because just as insurers are asking more questions, we are expecting that finance providers are going to be asking more questions uh, as well. Um, as we all know, uh, when it comes to renewing your PI, uh, the insurers won't confirm cover unless they've got the cash in or very, very um, firm um, arrangements in place um, for financing. It's going to take um, longer, so uh, we urge firms to start looking uh, at that issue now. Okay, and um, moving on to another slide again, Emma. Yeah, just some final comments here um, from me. Um, some beware um, items. First of all, we would say beware about reducing your limit of indemnity as a way of controlling um, your premium spend. It could be tempting to think, well, do we need as much cover? We'll take less and that will save um, on the premium. But it's really important to remember that you've got an obligation under uh, 3.1 of the SRA indemnity insurance rules to have adequate and appropriate insurance, taking into account your current and past practice. Um, so you need to be um, careful on that. You need to review it each renewal and document um, your consideration and decision on that. Likewise, um, increasing your self-insured um, excess is a way of controlling premium spend. Uh, again, um, you'd be surprised that you know, it is unlikely to take out as much um, of the premium as you think. And the other thing is that you need to be sure that you're going to be able to afford the premium if a claim rises or if three claims arise in the, in the one policy year because they do tend to be like buses and all arrive um, at once. There's, there's nothing worse um, from an underwriter's perspective than a firm coming to you saying that they can't afford to pay their excess or can they um, pay it by way of um, installments. That's a, a huge red flag and you don't want to be in that situation. Uh, likewise, um, insurers have an obligation under the participating insurers agreement to report non-payment um, to the SRA, so you don't want to come to the SRA's attention either. Uh, relying on the extended indemnity period, this is an additional um, 30 days during which you can um, proceed to operate on a business as usual basis and then another 60 days to close the practice. You do not want to go into the extended um, policy period if you can help it at all. Again, there's a requirement to notify the SRA. Um, it's an issue that um, you're likely to have to disclose on future proposal forms. And because any cover that you do get, perhaps two weeks later, has to be backdated um, to the 1st of October, um, you know, there will be an issue if you've had a claim come in on the 5th of October and the, the premium that you're quoted will need to take that um, and any other matters um, into, into account. And a final word there is, and I've said it, you know, throughout this um, presentation, beware of leaving it too late. This is, you know, absolutely not um, the year to, uh, to do that. Um, we know that sometimes firms think that, you know, if they leave it to the last minute, there'll be deals to be had. Um, not this year, that would be a, a very high risk um, strategy indeed. So that's the thumbnail sketch. And as I said, there's a lot more information in our market report, um, which will be uh, available uh, to you through legal news. So thank you, Claire, back to you. Thanks very much, Jenny, um, for those comments. Um, absolutely fascinating and obviously, um, something that I'm sure we'll all take on board actually it doesn't matter really on the size of your firm they're all um, extremely helpful comments so thank you very much for that so Jenny um, talked um, 
in her section about some of the areas that are causing particular concern uh, to insurers and she mentioned biofunded developments. So Emma, if you could put up the next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk about some current trends um, and then I'm going to, um, if you could put the next slide up, sorry, as well, please. Then I'm going to look at certain uh, areas that have really caused uh, a lot of grief uh, to many of our clients. The first one is biofunded developments. I'm going to then talk about um, the claims that arise against solicitors for uh, failing to consider multiple dwelling relief in the context of stamp duty. And finally, I'm just going to touch on cyber fraud, which was another theme that Jenny mentioned. So first of all, if we look at biofunded developments, um, some may never have heard of them. And actually, if you haven't, you're, you're very lucky because um, they have caused an enormous headache uh, to a number of uh, firms and also to the market generally. Um, what is a biofunded development or a BFD as they've become <laughs> for short? Um, well, the key features of a biofunded development uh, are that often they involve foreign investors and often these foreign investors are hooked in overseas by agents in their country of origin. So uh, a lot of agents uh, in the Far East. They hook in overseas investors um, who then pay a non-refundable deposit of perhaps between three and five thousand pounds. The investment companies who are selling these investments and, and the investments range from um, student pods um, near universities to uh, flats for um, uh, old age pensioners in um, beautiful uh, developments. Um, and they also include things like car parking spaces near airports, um, carbon credits. There are all sorts of different investments that these uh, companies uh, use to entice uh, foreign investors uh, into uh, thinking that these, these are going to be a fantastic deal. They offer high returns and uh, this is something that is obviously we'll come on to this but this is something that the, has really caught the SRA's attention because many of the features of these uh, biofunded developments actually dovetail quite neatly with uh, the sort of features that the SRA uh, uses uh, when it says um, that uh, solicitors should beware of uh, dubious investment schemes. So a lot of the same features um, uh, can be seen in biofunded development. So um, the investor pays a non-refundable deposit and then they instruct a firm of solicitors often from a panel that's offered to them by the uh, investor investment company, the selling investment company. The firm of solicitors comes on board. In our experience, um, many of them did not cover, cover off absolutely everything uh, that they should have covered off in terms of warning uh, these investors of the risks of investing in these types of deals. And as a result of that, um, they're exposed to claims because uh, the investment companies uh, require an 80%, sometimes as much as an 80% deposit on exchange of contracts rather than the usual 10%. The contract is drawn in such a way uh, as to enable the investment company to take that 80% uh, deposit and then to use it maybe sometimes even to buy the land, but certainly use it against the development costs. So effectively, you're parting with 80% of the purchase price when there is um, no asset, if you're an investor. So a very risky situation for you. Um, the investor obviously has already paid a, um, a non-refundable deposit. So to an extent, they're, they're already locked in. Um, but the investor is offered um, high returns on the basis of, for example, in the case of student pods, they're offered um, four year guaranteed rental incomes, um, which uh, is sometimes taken off the purchase price as well at the beginning. So they, they look fantastic. They offer returns of over 100% on your investment, sometimes over limited periods of time. Um, typically, uh, the developer will have set up a buyer's company and the investors are told that they have additional security as a result of that because the buyer company can check how the money is being spent. The solicitor um, who's acting for them can be a director of the buyer company so that they say gives them even, even more security. And quite often uh, they also say that these uh, schemes are backed by insurance uh, policies uh, which uh, we have found in the cases that we've dealt with anyway are worth nothing. And so we haven't yet managed to find a solicitor who did become a director of the buyer's company and so there was there was very little control exercised uh, over how money was spent. Um, 
very unscrupulous investment companies in most cases uh, who um, pocketed the money and in a lot of cases perhaps built one development so that people could see that but then after that some of the developments we've uh, reviewed haven't even got planning permission um, so they are absolutely nowhere in terms of um, any sort of asset against which the investors can um, enforce when inevitably the investment company goes bust. So most of these companies are now in administration um, and the investors are having to prove in the administration to try to pull back something but it's very difficult for many of them to make any sort of recovery. As far as the insurance policies are concerned we haven't yet found one that's paid out. They tend to be overseas insurers with very limited share capital uh, who are just simply not good for the money. Um, so as I say, inevitably the developer takes the money, uh, the, the development isn't finished, um, and uh, as a result, uh, the investors then look um, and cast around as to who they can uh, blame and against, against whom can they bring a claim. Now obviously for the solicitors who represent multiple purchasers, and I'm talking about some solicitors who represent hundreds and hundreds of purchasers on numerous developments, because it's, it, it was a bit like a production line, so once you were instructed on one you would be instructed on uh, numerous more. And so for the solicitors, like I say, who acted for the purchasers, it's quite obvious how uh, they end up in the firing line as, uh, as far as the investors are concerned, and the allegations that investors make are fairly obvious, so they say you were negligent, and in breach of your contract with me because you didn't warn me of the risks and as a result of that failure to warn, um, look where I am, I've lost all my money. Um, solicitors who acted for the vendor investment companies um, might think that they um, have a proper defence to the investors' claims because they would say, with some force, that they didn't have any contract with the investors so they don't owe them a duty and uh, they should be able to escape liability. The difficulty is that there are varying degrees of these schemes, but the worst ones, which appear uh, really to be sham uh, schemes, um, are, are so bad that there, there is still a possibility uh, that the uh, investors can bring a proper claim against the uh, vendors solicitors on the basis that they've completely misrepresented the position. And it doesn't really end there. So um, there are the civil claims, um, which, you know, as Jenny has just mentioned, you have to be able to fund your excess, which, which can be, um, you, you know, a very serious issue for firms who have multiple claims. Um, there's that aspect of it. Um, but also the SRA is very interested uh, in these schemes. And as I said earlier, many of the features of these schemes dovetail quite nicely from the SRA's perspective with their definition of a dubious investment scheme. And in fact, if you look at the examples um, in the code of conduct um, that the SRA has, has written to try to guide solicitors through this process, you'll see that student pods and car parking spaces and all of the kind of things that we've been talking about uh, are the examples that the SRA gives um, as being uh, schemes that you really need to scrutinise uh, properly. So, you know, you have a regulatory risk as well as a civil risk and, and with that comes all of the reputational damage and, and the worry because um, some, some solicitors have, there have been a lot of solicitors in the news actually over the last few weeks who've been sanctioned by the SRA in relation to these sorts of schemes. Many of them have just been fined but some have faced a greater sanction than that and so it's not territory uh, really that's uh, desirable and as Jenny has said uh, if you've been doing these schemes and you have to disclose that on your proposal form then it's likely uh, that given the hit that the market has taken in relation to these claims they are going to uh, be scrutinizing uh, those firms very carefully and it might affect their decision uh, to cover in our experience so uh, the other clear risk uh, to firms is that because they're acting on multiple purchases um, or sales um, in one development the insurers might say well we're going to treat all of those claims against you as one we're going to aggregate all of those claims under the policy and that means that you might have hundreds of claims but you've only got your basic two or three million of cover and so all of the claims put together are going to come to more than your policy limit so again a, a real doomsday scenario uh, for firms who um, thought that they had um, really hit on a great sort of work stream, but now um, it's all beginning to unravel. Um, the SRA also says, of course, that firms who get involved for um, vendors in these schemes 
lend credibility to the fraudulent scheme. So in other words, they, they, they also play a part in hooking in uh, these um, unwitting um, investors. So altogether, uh, very bad news. And um, if you are offered a place on a panel like this, then I would say uh, that it's definitely worth having a very serious conversation with your colleagues about it and potentially also even consulting with the SRA to find out what their view uh, is of the matter because they're not to be um, entered into lightly. So um, that's um, biofunded developments. Um, if we turn over the slide, Emma, please. Thank you. The other claims that we've seen, which haven't, uh, which are not as, as serious um, in terms of uh, financial, uh, the financial aspect of them, but which are nevertheless a real thorn in the side of property firms, are claims arising out of a failure to advise on multiple dwelling relief. So, first of all, what is multiple dwelling relief? Well, as most property lawyers um, will know, multiple dwelling relief is a particular relief uh, that was originally really designed for um, commercial buyers. Uh, who were buying buy-to-let properties, uh, several of them, and multiple dwelling relief is a relief that you can apply for from the revenue uh, as a means of saving stamp duty land tax, and the savings are quite significant. Um, so against that background, um, really that HMRC viewed uh, multiple dwelling relief as, as a sort of relief for commercial buyers, um, it's quite surprising then to find that actually the way that um, the rules have recently been interpreted is that if you have an annex in your garden, that can also be, be treated in certain circumstances as a separate dwelling. And if it is a separate dwelling and it meets the criteria for that, then when you're acting for a purchaser and you are um, aware that there is an annex in the garden, you should really be exploring with that client uh, whether or not multiple dwelling relief might be available so that they can make a saving in terms of um, stamp duty land tax. Um, the claims tend to be relatively low level, but as I say, uh, they are an, a thorn in the side of uh, conveyancing solicitors because there are so many of them. And why are there so many of them? Well, mainly because there's a firm of solicitors called Stenfields, and there are some other firms as well like them, uh, who are encouraging claimants somehow or another there surveying the market and they're working out where properties have been sold, where they have annexes, and they're just bringing claims. Um, and uh, as I say, they're, they're, they're all on no win, no fees. And so they're just um, bringing as many claims as they can against firms. And on the uh, current interpretation of HMRC's rules, some of those claims are difficult to defend, not all of them. And I've talked about possible defences there because many firms understandably feel that if they start giving in to Stenfields and paying out claims, then where will, where will it end? And so they're concerned about floodgates. Um, and so we've been very keen to think about all of the possible defences that might uh, possibly be available to solicitors who find themselves in this situation. Um, there is a, uh, an argument that the longer ago that the transaction took place, um, the less of an obligation, so the lower the standard of care was on the solicitor uh, to advise on this, because this is something that has only come to light in the last few years. Um, do we think that will succeed uh, ultimately if you took that argument to trial? Well, it's it's certainly not a dead cert and it's probably a 60-40 situation, so it's not, it's not the best argument probably, but it is an argument uh, that we put forward on behalf of uh, solicitors. Other arguments, uh, involve um, the factual background of these annexes because not all of them are proper separate dwellings and so you have to examine for example whether there's a lockable door, are they separate for council tax, do they have separate utilities and only after you've been through all of those steps uh, can you really assess whether or not multiple dwelling relief, relief would have been available and that also feeds in uh, to a causation argument that we think is um, a proper argument and has merit which is that if you advise a client that a certain relief uh, may be available, uh, then you can't say to them that it definitely will be because we've seen recently a first tier tax tribunal decision which held that the annex was not a separate dwelling. And if, if the revenue fined against you, then you're likely to be paying interest and penalties on your, stamp, on your stamp duty bill as well. And so the question is how many purchasers in that situation, if all of it had been explained to them, would have said, well, I'm willing to take the chance that not only will I have to pay a whacking great big STLT bill, but I also might have to pay 
interest and penalties are on top of that. Uh, I would say not all of them. And so I think there's, there's an argument around that as well. Finally, um, a lot of these claims do fall below the £10,000 limit. So there are lots of them, but a lot of them are low level, as I said before. If a claim is worth less than £10,000, really it should be in the small claims track. And that means that the claimant shouldn't get any costs, which obviously isn't what Stemfield wants out of this because they want to be recovering, um, want to be recovering their costs. And so we're trying to put as much pressure as we can uh, in terms of any litigated cases to try to diffuse the situation and to try at least uh, to see whether or not uh, we can uh, put Stemfields off because, uh, it, as I say, it's quite clear that they're reviewing, how do they do it, right move, I don't know, but uh, they're reviewing lots of transactions with a view to bringing claims. So, so they are um, featuring quite highly at the moment, but they're not the kind of huge claims that you see on the biofunded investment schemes, obviously, so they're not as big a concern to insurers or to solicitors as they are. And so um, next and finally, Emma, sorry, no, thank you, um, cyber fraud. So ransomware attacks are predicted to cost uh, something like $20 billion globally by the end of 2021. Um, and the solicitor's profession is not immune uh, from these sorts of attacks. And on the contrary, a study in the US found that over 10% of the attacks involve professional services firms. Um, the result of these sorts of attacks obviously can be loss of valuable data takes a heavy toll financially and on organisations of all sizes and also a heavy toll in, for, in reputational terms. Hackers are becoming increasingly uh, sophisticated and um, we've seen this um, in some of the cases that we've been uh, dealing with. Um, one case that we recently dealt with involved um, hackers who sent a link uh, to a conveyancing solicitor which was uh, mocked up to look as though it was uh, the usual kind of alert information that you get from the land registry. Um, I get them because I do uh, claims that relate to property but conveyancers get them as a matter of course and actually th this conveyancer system quarantined uh, the link um, but as you, as, you, as you know you can go into the, that and you can release or block and she released and she uh, forwarded the link uh, to some colleagues because she wasn't really sure what it was. Um, as a result of opening the link and sending it on, um, uh, she uh, inadvertently exposed the firm to what was in fact um, a phishing email. And as a result of that, the hackers were able to intercept her emails to a client and vice versa, the client's emails to her. Um, they were able uh, to um, easily convince uh, the client that the client had received a request for payment in relation to a conveyancing transaction and they were then able to divert the, the um, proceeds of sale uh, to their own account. Luckily in that case um, the solicitor acted very quickly and uh, a lot of the uh, monies that had been diverted um, to the hackers uh, were actually recovered um, but more and more we're really relying on banks to try to recover the money because uh, the police are uh, so overworked um, that uh, they, they, in that case and in many cases that we deal with, they don't seem to take the necessary steps and certainly not quickly enough to try to recover the money. The banks, on the other hand, uh, are far more astute and were aware of the fraud uh, before even, I think, uh, the client was. And that's often the case. How? We don't know because they don't tell us. But, um, but they do seem to be, um, particularly HSBC and some of the other bigger banks uh, are very fraud aware. Um, but again, um, a huge headache and, and how do you combat that? Particularly now with lockdown, people working from home using mobile devices. I mean, it's about, I think, understanding the nature of uh, these frauds. It's about um, training um, for employees and uh, also in some cases, uh, it's about systems. And so, for example, Mimecast comes as standard with the ability to uh, access it through a web browser, but that is an, uh, unfortunately an open door to hackers. And so um, you can turn that facility off and just have it um, for uh, times perhaps where you have business interruption and you need to turn it on again. Um, Office 365 is another um, known um, risk um, to, the, to, the, to uh, the solicitor's profession, but generally, 
And so the key um, issues are really having proper intelligence and advice about the kind of systems that you've got, how attacks work and what your weak points are, and then closing those doors that might be ajar uh, to avoid uh, these kinds of attacks. And it's about training, as we all know, and staying alert, as, um, as we will have to anyway at the moment. But um, finally, um, and the next one, I just wanted to look at what the future might hold for the profession. Obviously, in times of uh, recession, which um, inevitably, um, unfortunately, we're going into a time of very serious uh, recession, um, you see a lot more claims against uh, professionals, particularly um, solicitors and after that surveyors. So as far as solicitors are concerned, this is when um, people as old as Jenny and I remember the last two recessions, actually, and both times we saw a real prevalence of claims by lenders against solicitors. Um, some people say, well, this, you know, this is when you see fraud. Fraud is always there. So there's always borrower fraud, which can rebound on solicitors if they're not very careful in the context of uh, representing borrowers and purchasers in transactions. Fraud is always there, but it comes to light in a recession because that's when lenders start to repossess properties and that's when they start to pick over the kind of information they've been given uh, by the solicitor in the report on title. And then they start to uh, pick holes in that and look at how they can recover some of their losses because obviously by then the borrower's covenant is worth nothing, they can't repay the mortgage and the property market's fallen so they're not going to get their money back against the security so they look for other means of doing it and um, <clears throat> that I think is one of the biggest risks uh, to the profession now entering the next recession and obviously there are other ancillary risks um, which uh, many of which as, as Jenny has said are, are associated with um, lockdown and with furloughing, because when you uh, furlough a lot of people, you have to make very sure um, that you keep on top of their work, particularly in property work. So if you've exchanged contracts and not completed, you have to be thinking about what's going to happen to that transaction, people um, losing their jobs or even unfortunately dying between exchange and completion. These are all things that we, we as a professional will have to keep on top of. And um, for some firms, um, it's, it's not as easy as for others. And so if you don't have a good case management system, if you don't have uh, careful supervision, then these are the kind of things I think that as a result of lockdown and furloughing uh, are likely to cause problems, particularly um, for property lawyers, but not just for property lawyers actually. So um, as solicitors, all of our work is very time bound. And uh, so we will see claims arising out of missed uh, deadlines, not just in property work, but also, as Catherine will cover now, uh, in relation to uh, claims against litigators and litigation lawyers. So if I hand you over to Catherine, who's going to look at claims trends uh, against litigation uh, lawyers. Thank you, Claire. Um, so as Claire's just mentioned, I'm going to speak uh, very briefly in relation to professional negligence claims arising from underlying litigation. I'm going to um, try and deal with it as quickly as possible because um, I'm not sunburnt, I'm just hot and I just need to open a window. <laughs> um, so um, I'm sure that all of you want to go for your lunch, but um, I'm going to look at failed or mismanaged uh, litigation claims. I'm then going to look at the effect of the loss of opportunity approach to quantum. And then I'm going to finish off looking at some COVID-19 issues affecting litigation and to try to give those litigators who are here today um, or risk managers um, that have come online some tips of things to consider and to be wary of um, and to take back to your firms which hopefully will assist in avoiding claims not just in this period but um, obviously going forward. So if I can have the new slide Emma. Thanks. So claims arising from litigation are not as common as property claims, and I'm sure that won't come as a surprise um, to any of you. But when they hit, they tend to hit big. And what I mean by this is that they're either of high value or they might be class actions. 
um, or they're ones that are expensive to run in terms of costs from a claimant perspective and a defendant's perspective. And um, you can imagine that litigation files tend to be larger files than uh, property transactions. They um, could go on for a number of months and years. And um, generally litigators are better than property practitioners in preparing attendance notes so they seem to be full of files as well and so um, as I say they can be um, uh, matters where which are document heavy and as a result um, have an impact on costs. Um, so the cases that we usually see arising from litigation, um, as I mentioned, a failed or mismanaged litigation. And, and by that, I mean um, there's been a failure to issue proceedings within the limitation period, failure to serve a claim form or to serve particulars of claim within a, a given period and um, potentially to to failure to prosecute a claim effectively in accordance with the rules or some other procedural breach. Um, the large claims that um, we've seen coming through um, involve uh, personal injury litigation. And um, these claims, um, the ones that we've dealt with recently, are ones which have involved things like missed brain injuries or claims which have settled early when the claimant's diagnosis is unclear. Um, they're pursued because they're valuable claims. And you can see how that um, can happen in uh, these type of matters, because if there's been a failure to uh, claim uh, for care, or if there's been a failure to claim for future loss of earnings, the potential value of those matters are high. Um, so to give you an example of the type of uh, matters that we've been dealing with, um, I represented uh, a firm of solicitors recently in a claim where um, the claimant was a minor and had um, suffered injuries following a road traffic accident. Um, the claim was settled um, at an infant approval hearing. Um, but when the claimant reached uh, majority, it became apparent that there was, some, there was a psychiatric injury involved and the, the claimant um, was sectioned and was living in secure accommodation. And so solicitors then acting for uh, the claimant then went and looked back and were able to show that the psychiatric injury um, was caused by the road traffic accident. And that meant that uh, the claim for professional negligence uh, was brought and it was a big claim for reasons that I've just said. The care element was significant because um, it hadn't been claimed previously and uh, the claimant was in secure accommodation. And given that they had only just re recently reached majority, then future loss of earnings um, was going to have a, an impact on the matter. Um, another claim that we dealt with was um, a very simple personal injury claim where the claimant had fallen off a ladder during their employment, broken an ankle, brought a claim for personal injury. Um, what had also happened during that fall is that they'd hit their head and the claim um, hadn't been explored in terms of any head injuries and it transpired that there was um, a, a brain injury uh, involved in that matter. And so again, professional negligence claim is brought um, um, in, in that way. Um, other type of litigation that we see um, are class actions involving uh, personal injury matters. So uh, you'll all be aware of minor, the minor um, claims, the VWF claims that um, are now coming to an end, but obviously that they involved um, class actions and multiple claimants. And um, we've seen them replaced uh, by noise induced hearing loss uh, claims. Um, so professional negligence claims arising from those type of matters and also holiday sickness claims. But I think given where we are now that they will probably um, not uh, develop as we had previously anticipated. Um, but the allegations that are made in relation to those matters are that the solicitors failed to investigate or assess the merits of the claim and have just dealt with them en masse because the claimant solicitors tell to, tend to, tended to de deal with a number of claimants. And so obviously if you're um, 
if you're a firm of solicitors that have dealt with hundreds of these claims for people claiming noise induced hearing loss um, matters if there's some negligence that is common on everything then the tendency is that you have a multiple claimant professional negligence claim being brought against you and the allegations that were made they were dealt with by you know simply ticking the boxes so Emma if I can have the next slide please so I can't talk about professional indemnity litigation, uh, professional indemnity claims arising from litigation without mentioning how you would uh, quantify uh, loss. And uh, you'll all probably know that uh, we look at these claims by looking at them um, from a loss of chance perspective. And they can be quite frustrating uh, to deal with because of that. Um, obviously, it requires the court to assess what might have happened in the underlying claim if there's been no breach of duty. Um, the claims sometimes allow the claimants to recover even when the lost opportunity is assessed at less than 50%. And um, that can cause um, some insured clients of ours who we act for to get very frustrated. Um, you're not meant to be retrying the underlying claim. So it's not a trial within a trial. It's meant to be there to measure the prospects of success and to assess damages on a broad percentage basis. There are cases, for example, some of the ones that I've mentioned already, where obviously you're going to have to conduct matters as if it's an underlying personal injury claim where you have to get um, uh, expert evidence, you have to get care reports, you have to get actuarial evidence sometimes. So um, there are obviously some cases where it is more or less like that, but that's not how you're meant to be dealing with these matters. The claimant has to show that there's a real or substantial chance, so that means more than fanciful, that in the absence of uh, negligence, a third party would have acted in a way that the claimant asserts. Um, so I think that's all I'll say in terms of loss of opportunity. I, I'm conscious of the time, but um, with that in mind and the frustration that that does sometimes cause, I thought that um, I would look at some uh, practical tips to uh, and help people avoid these type of claims being brought against them. And I've obviously concentrated on some tips um, during COVID-19, but I think that generally they're relevant um, at any given time. Um, so obviously court hearings now are mostly virtual hearings, telephone hearings, Skype hearings, uh, hearings by team. So um, we've heard of hearings in lots of different ways uh, recently. And it goes without saying, I'm sure, that just make sure that you're familiar with um, the platform that's being used and what the arrangements are. And um, I, I think of myself in here as well because just before joining here I was looking um, in a panic for the for the uh, join in details so it's, it's something that um, you don't need to put yourself under that pressure and be prepared for it if you're doing the hearing yourself just make sure that you've tried uh, tried the te technology beforehand um, I dealt with a claim once where um, through no fault of the solicitor they just the court just couldn't get through to them on a telephone hearing and it was an application to strike out their client's claim and he just was unable to attend and the claim was struck out in his absence and um, whilst that's obviously an extreme example uh, it is important to ensure that you can at least attend and the same applies obviously if you're instructing counsel um, make sure that they are aware of the um, the arrangements and obviously if you're instructing them remotely the last thing you want is that you're sat there and your counsel isn't there um, because again that's just a, a horrible feeling linked to uh, these virtual hearings um, is um, the issue of electronic uh, bundles um, they are quite difficult to prepare and if you haven't got the backroom staff or the administrative staff to assist because of furloughing etc then they are going to be time consuming and difficult uh, for you. Um, they have to be prepared with proper indexes, they have to be prepared with proper hyperlinks and um, you have to check 
with the court and if it's you know if it's in the QBD what the master is requiring because they're all different they all have their own preferences they all have their guidance um, and guidelines so um, just make sure that you know that what you're doing is correct and that it actually works um, and associated with that is just something that I thought I would mention and that's the cost of that because it will take you longer to prepare those kind of bundles um, compared to um, if you were just putting something through a photocopier and tabbing, tabbing the documents to be copied. Um, so if that's the case um, and you need to have a conversation with your client in relation to the cost then be open, be grown up and have that conversation. It might not have a, a, an effect on costs because you might not have to attend the hearing um, in person. You don't have to go to London maybe for it because it's a virtual hearing. So it might balance itself out. But I think a lot of the claims that we see um, arising are often ones that um, arise following a complaint in relation to costs. So just something to bear in mind and, and to have that conversation if you need to. So basically what I'm saying is, you need to prepare for a remote hearing well in advance and um, further in advance really than you would ordinarily um, if it was a hearing in person. Um, there's obviously some flexibility and discretion at the moment in terms of directions and time scales and deadlines. Um, we obviously can all extend uh, directions by up to 56 days as opposed to the 28 days that we previously could. Um, if you do this, just make sure that they're diarised properly um, and uh, make sure that the old dates are taken out so to avoid any confusion. Um, and I say this especially um, because of the situation that we're in. If you have a team where you're working on things together, make sure that everyone has uh, the dates in their diaries because if there is um, a situation where someone is ill, then someone else can pick them up. Um, just be aware that uh, that extension to the direction of up to 56 days doesn't apply to a defence, um, so that's just something to be wary of. Um, and if you deal with personal injury claims, um, you might want to look at uh, signing up to the personal injury protocol, which um, is an agreement between insurers and claimant solicitors um, in relation to freezing of limitation, so just something for you to think about. Um, the general understanding is that COVID-19 will be taken into account if there's a failure to comply with directions, but um, top to don't rely on it. Uh, the, we were in a hearing yesterday in front of um, Master Cook, who was um, not particularly sympathetic to certain um, issues that arose. So, um, as I say, don't count on judges being uh, sympathetic, uh, despite us being in the middle of a pandemic. Um, if there are certain tasks that you need to carry out which uh, require s signatures, so witness statements, schedules of loss, particulars of claim, or even if you have to sign um, applications, just make sure, again, think ahead that the practical arrangements that um, need to be made um, can be made and that you will get the documents back signed appropriately and in time. Um, and just very quickly, I couldn't finish without mentioning um, remote mediations. Um, my advice to you is don't shy away from them. I've done two um, during lockdown and I was skeptical before my first one. I was forced to mediate um, because of a court order um, and I was worried that you wouldn't um, they wouldn't be as effective. But what I can say is that they're conducted usually by Zoom. And obviously you're not there in person, but it is really the next best thing. You're, you can be taken into uh, individual rooms with your clients. You can be taken, in, taken into a room um, as an, where there's an opening session. You can be taken into a room with a mediator alone. Um, and so, as I say, it does operate exactly as if you were there in person. And um, I say this, especially given um, that I was reading um, the other day about some decisions um, in relation to refusing to mediate that have been, um, her, have been made recently. So there was a decision where a defendant had been successful in the defense of a claim, um, but um, uh, 
were penalised in relation to their costs because of the fact that they'd refused to mediate. There was another one where a claimant was uh, awarded indemnity costs because the defendant had been silent in relation to a request for ADR um, during the case. So don't find yourself in that position. Um, don't shy away from it just because it's virtual. If it's the right time to mediate on a case of yours, um, I definitely would recommend giving it a go because I didn't expect to settle either of my claims, but um, they, they did. And one of them um, was at one o'clock in the morning, but the, the, the beauty of that was that I just had two seconds to jump into my bed. So, um, you know, I think that after all of this is over, I, I think that they won't go away. I think that um, remote mediations may be something that people will consider going forward. And one of the reasons for that is because there are obvious cost savings um, associated with, with that. Um, finally, uh, it's an odd one to put on the slide, you might think, but I've just put down um, on, on the slide, deal with your opponent respectively, uh, respectfully. Um, and that is important. Some of the litigation professional negligence files that we see um, are ones that you um, read and think, goodness, what's the judge going to think uh, about uh, this file? Because you've got legal representatives at loggerheads. And uh, one of the things that I um, have picked up from being trained by Claire over the years and one of the things that I've, I've picked up many things but this is a, one of the really good things um, that uh, she used to say to me when she's supervising letters would you be happy for a judge to see this letter if it's overly aggressive or if you're saying something in a way that um, isn't isn't right so um, make sure that you uh, treat your opponent with respect at all times make sure that you obviously do the best job for your clients and take all the points that you need to take but I think especially in this um, day and age um, where you've got SRA looking at you um, under the magnifying glass and looking at the way that you operate. Um, make sure that you do um, write appropriately. Make sure that you treat your opponent with respect because um, they are difficult times and you just never know when someone um, will be looking at your papers and at least then you'll be able to say um, or ask for a favour um, and, and you won't be criticised in terms of the way that you've conducted it. And I think that um, on those cases where there's been overly aggressive correspondence, you tend to think that you probably haven't done the best job for your client um, because there's wasted costs, but also you probably haven't reached the resolution of the claim in the way that you would have if you'd have been on better terms with your opponent. So, that's all that um, I wanted to say. You probably think I'm talking rubbish on that last point, but um, just uh, thought I'd mention it. Not at all. Thanks, Katrin. I'm just going to stop sharing my slides. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to get you all back on gallery view so I can see everybody. Um, we'll start the Q&A session. Um, I haven't, uh, there's nothing quite yet in the chat function. Has anybody got any questions either for Jenny or for Claire or for Katrin at all? If you want to unmute yourself, you'd be very welcome. Not a problem if you do. I've got one for Jenny actually. Um, Jenny, how much, um, how much do you think that insurers are looking at uh, types of claims? And in particular, I am thinking of the biofunded development situation because I'm aware that some insurers are changing their proposal forms to try to cover off a situation where, um, you know, they inadvertently get involved with a, with a firm that's done a lot of these. Is that something that you're seeing in terms of, at, you know, really drilling down into work types? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, this is an issue that is, is very high on their radar um, because of the money that they um, have already paid out into the, the reserves um, that they have um, they've got. So all the insurers are very, very aware of this issue um, and the questions on the proposal form are directed um, towards um, discovering the extent to which any firms have undertaken um, this activity. So. Um, yeah, it's, you know, in, in terms of um, 
um, the radar, it's it's very high um, up there. I mean, you know, a few years ago, they all had, um, you know, prime lenders and, and bonds let um, at the top of the radar, but this is the um, issue that is currently, um, yeah, getting a great deal of attention. And do you see any other um, trends like that, or is, is that the real big one? I mean, I think probably cyber would be another, would it? I yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, and, you know, a great deal more questions um, around, you know, protection from a cyber um, perspective that firms uh, have in place. Again, off the back of, you know, insurers having to um, pay, you know, very significant claims when client accounts have uh, been emptied. Uh, in addition uh, to that, um, Will's um, probate estate administration do keep coming up on the list as um, being... Um, a source of some concerning um, claims and there's more claims rising from that area of practice as well, which is understandable given that, you know, um, the world's quite different, you know, we have, um, you know, blended um, families and um, different, um, um, you know, potential um, people thinking um, that they're going to inherit and being disappointed when they um, don't um, inherit. You know, property values are much higher, which makes those kind of claims, um, you know, more attractive to a potential claimant to pursue as well. So that's another area that's coming under more scrutiny um, than, it, um, than it used to. Um, another issue that's actually, you know, on the radar as well is um, home equity release work. Now, we haven't seen a huge amount of claims activity from that yet, um, but, you know, it's, um, it's an area where insurers will be concerned because, you know, we are seeing, you know, so many more people um, move to release equity from, um, from their homes. So, yeah, I think there's right. anybody undertaking that work you need to just really, you know, look closely at your risk management processes. Yeah, and in fact, we did see that a few years ago, didn't we? We saw some of those claims, but some of them were, uh, some of them seemed to arise out of um, situations where solicitors had become involved unwittingly uh, with quite unscrup unscrupulous companies who were really not paying what they ought to pay to the individuals who were trying to release the equity. So I can think of a few cases we did probably about eight or nine years ago now, mm. where we mm. saw that. So that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Do you think, Jenny, that that will, um, going back to wills and probate, that that will be under increasing scrutiny due to the last uh, few months and the impact of COVID? Um, uh, it, you know, yes, and you know, I think it, it will. We know there's been a huge increase in you know, wills that um, have been um, completed and you only need to get a disappointed beneficiary um, to you know, go along and see a solicitor and start to unpack the way the um, the will was completed, um, the signing arrangements around it. So, uh, yes, I'm, I think, regrettably, um, as a result of the situation that we've been in, that will, you know, um, be a, be another dimension to these claims going forward. I think you're right, Jenny, because the other the other thing that we've been considering is the issue of. Um, the solicitor who's trying to assess capacity by the testator, and that's obviously much more difficult now. And it's much more difficult to assess it because you probably can't, you might not be able to meet them in person. But it's also difficult because if you start to uh, think about, you know, where where in the past wills and probate lawyers would have recommended a doctor's examination, that's not quite so easy now. Mm. Um, and um, And also if you're taking instructions by telephone, you don't necessarily know that there's no undue influence going on. You know, one of the beneficiaries could be there in the background um, trying to influence what the what the person's doing. So I think there are sort of multiple things really to, to be careful of now that we're not able to see clients in quite the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm.